I'm joined today by Dr. Dante Loretta, who's professor of planetary science and cosmochemistry at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He's also the principal investigator of NASA's Osiris Rex mission, which is the first U.S. space mission to return a sample of an asteroid back to Earth. So, Dr. Loretta, let's start sort of at the at the broadest point, which is a lot of discussion about Mars going on right now. Of course, we know about the moon, not as much discussion of asteroids in the context of space exploration. What's the place of asteroid research in your mind? Uh, asteroids are important for many reasons. Uh, personally, for me, I think they have a lot of science value. When you go to an asteroid, you're basically going to the earliest remnants from the geologic history of our solar system. So when you're asking questions about how did our planet form, why do we have oceans, how did the origin of life occur, asteroids are the place you go to find those. But they also have some future implications. First of all, we're interested in them as resources. They may contain those waters and those organic molecules and even precious metals that would be very useful for future space exploration. And finally, they are natural disasters waiting to happen. We worry about the impact hazard. And if humanity is going to survive long term as a species, we need to understand these objects in great detail, particularly how they move through space and how we might be able to change their course if needed. What do we know about the, the range of materials that that could make up asteroids? And I've always had this idea, you know, I'm, I'm sort of against diamonds for a number of reasons. And lucky for me, I've successfully explained it to my girlfriend as well, which is really convenient. Uh, but in my mind, aside from the fact that we already know the, the value of diamonds is artificially inflated on Earth by restricting supply, in the back of my mind, I wonder if we'll find an asteroid completely made of diamonds, which will just make everybody who's ever bought a diamond feel really bad. Uh, what do we know? I mean, is that a realistic possibility? Uh, we have a pretty good understanding of the basic composition of asteroids because pieces of them land on Earth already as meteorites, and there's been a long history of meteorite analysis to help us understand these objects. And what they're primarily made out of is metal and rocky material with some organics and some signs of ice in their past, which has since melted and reacted to form things like clay minerals. I would say a diamond asteroid would be very highly unlikely because of the enormous pressures that are required for that transformation to take place. All right, fair enough. Well, I'll, I'll let my girlfriend know about that. Right. Uh, so the OSIRIS-REx mission, what is the plan? So we are just over 10 months away from launch. I just visited the spacecraft on Thursday. It's at the Lockheed Martin facility in Littleton, Colorado. And we have completed assembly and we are moving into the test phase. So we're starting system level testing where we put the vehicle through the range of environments that it needs to experience, both on the rocket ride up into space and then all of the environments it'll experience on the journey to asteroid Bennu and back to Earth. And tell us sort of how it will work. You will launch this craft from Earth. Will it actually land on an asteroid? Will it sort of match trajectories and take a sample? How will we get that sample back to Earth? Yeah, for most of our encounter with asteroid Bennu, where you can think of us as formation flying. We're orbiting the sun and the asteroid is orbiting the sun, and we got to match that orbit in direction and velocity as precisely as possible. So we can maneuver around because the gravity field of the asteroid is so small. We can look at it from different angles, different lighting conditions. We have cameras, we have science instruments called spectrometers, which break light apart into its different wavelengths and tell us about the minerals and chemicals that are on the surface. Our first uh, objective is to get a global map of the asteroid and to start to identify regions of interest. Ultimately, we will pick a single location on the asteroid surface and we'll go down for a brief five second touch and go contact where we'll basically vacuum up the loose material on the surface of the asteroid and prepare to bring that back to Earth. And then by what mechanism will we return that to Earth? Will it uh, is this something that is going to be dropped into the ocean and NASA will have to recover it? What are the logistics there? So we bring the whole spacecraft back to the vicinity of the Earth and then about four hours before hitting the top of the atmosphere, we'll eject and spin off a small return capsule. Then the main spacecraft will do a deflection maneuver and continue in orbit around the sun. The capsule is targeting the Utah test and training range just to the southwest of Salt Lake City. So we'll come in with parachutes and we'll do a soft landing in the Utah desert. And what happens to the rest of the craft that doesn't come back to us? 
Uh, hopefully it's still in good condition and we can think about extended missions and maybe targeting some other bodies in the solar system for investigation. But in the short term, will it just uh, like where, where will it go? What will happen with it? Uh, it'll be in orbit around the sun and we have to verify that it's not going to impact anything of interest, like come back and hit the earth or even crash on Mars because of the astrobiology importance there. Uh, it's on a trajectory actually to do a close approach to Venus. And that gives us a lot of options because we can use a maneuver called the gravity assist at Venus and target uh, almost anywhere in the solar system we'd want to go. Talk to our audience a little bit about that. Sometimes it can be sort of hard to think about planetary physics on this vast scale of, of years or decades, etc. Is there some simple way to explain why, you know, we hear about launch windows being very important, where if you miss a launch window to a particular place, even in our solar system, you might not get an opportunity for uh, many years more. How can someone sort of wrap their mind around the how to understand that? Yeah, so everything in the solar system pretty much is either going around the sun or going around a planet that's going around the sun. So you think of it kind of as a carousel, right? And if you wanted to get on a carousel and there was a particular horse you wanted to ride while it was moving, you would have to wait until you saw that horse coming up and time your entry onto that moving uh, target platform so you'd be right there at the right time going in the right direction. So you'd want to kind of match its speed and its direction and its location to rendezvous with it. And planetary physics is somewhat similar to that. And along those lines, you talked about uh, the connection between asteroids and the potential for natural disasters. This particular asteroid, approximately 1600 feet uh, di average diameter or about the size of four football fields. What would it take into? Well, question one is what is the mass of such an asteroid in, in your estimation? And what would it take for humans to develop some kind of technology to alter the path of such an asteroid? Yeah, so uh, you're right. Asteroid Bennu is 500 meters or about 1600 feet across. And when we think of the mass of an asteroid in terms of the impact hazard, we really think about the energy of the impact uh, if it were to hit the Earth. And so if Bennu were to hit the Earth, the energy that's released would be about 3,000 megatons, uh, which is many thousand times you know, a nuclear weapon yield. So it's, it would be a major natural disaster on a regional scale. Uh, in terms of uh, what we can do to change its course, that's a really good question. This is a, basically a mountain in space. And so changing it on a short time scale is pretty much impossible. What you need to be is forewarned. You need decades of advance notice to even have a chance of deflecting this. And then you've got to figure out a way to apply a small force constantly over a long period of time. And what, uh, what, what mechanisms might achieve that, that humans have sort of uh, access or potential access to? Yeah, there's a couple ideas that are out there. One is called a gravity tractor, where you basically put a mass in orbit around an asteroid where it does a very close approach on every orbit. And during that close approach, it'll exert a small gravitational tug and over an extended duration, it'll actually deflect the path of the asteroid. Another one that's related to the OSIRIS-REx science objectives is using a phenomena called the Yarkovsky effect. And for the Yarkovsky effect, when the asteroid absorbs sunlight and then radiates that energy back out as heat, that radiation of heat acts like a thruster and changes the course of the asteroid. So if you could somehow change the thermal properties of the asteroid surface, say by painting it white in certain areas and dark in other areas, you could harness the Yarkovsky effect and direct the asteroid over the long term as well. Fascinating. Uh, last thing I want to uh, touch on when the the idea of of asteroids and asteroid mining first surfaced, people immediately started thinking, OK, well, what what if we if we run out of a particular resource maybe on Earth? What if we could conceivably get it from an asteroid? Let's assume for a second there were resources that humans wanted on asteroids. Do the requirements in terms of fuel and other costs to m mine an asteroid, to whatever extent we, we understand what that would mean, do they work with regard to the value of the resources that might be obtained or do the numbers really not not support such a hypothesis? Um, I would say right now the numbers don't support such a hypothesis and you can just look at our mission. So we're going to bring back 60 grams up to two kilograms of surface sample from an asteroid. Right. 
And uh, we're spending about a billion dollars to do that. So that does not add up in terms of making money on our prospect. But you know, we're a pathfinder. We're the very first one from the United States to do this. So then it becomes a question of how do you scale that process up industrially to the point where the return is better than the initial investment. And to me, it comes down to access to space, getting the cost of these rocket launches down so that we're not spending $150 million or $200 million to put a couple thousand um, pounds of mass into orbit around the sun. And are you so excited? Are you excited about the involvement of companies like SpaceX and Boeing in uh, in working on the that that problem? I am very excited about the activities of, of the new space generation because it shows that people who have the resources privately are interested in investing in this area and you know, they know how to make money. They know how to manage money. I don't think they'd be investing just for their own hobbies. They really see a potential here. It does have a long timeline. You're looking at a couple decades probably before we start to see some return. But I think there is a viable market there long term. All right. Dr. Dante Loretta, principal investigator of NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission, and will certainly follow the mission uh, over the next 10 months as it gets ready to launch. Thanks so much for talking to us about it. Thanks for having me.